Hey guys, my name is Ray Spurd. Welcome to uh, Creating Creature Concepts in Photoshop with the HP ZBook X2. Is that the longest title you've ever heard? It should be. Uh, how are you guys doing? All right, all right, very good. I'm actually surprised to see a turnout because uh, we're talking about monsters and I know that, you know, it's a little bit of a contrast compared to photography and some of those other things. But I'm hoping you guys will be able to learn a few tricks and techniques that will apply to what you do. So even though it's under the scope of monsters, there's still a lot of techniques and tricks that still sort of work for other things. So, um, so I am a assistant professor at the University of Idaho. Uh, where I teach in the virtual technology and design program. And basically what that is, is we take virtual 3D tools and we create simulations, visualizations, and video games from it. And <laughs> the thing that I focus on, my specialty, is monstery stuff. Um, world building, uh, trying to create identities and, and kind of overall moods of things. And so here's a couple concepts I've done. I also do a lot of uh, makeup effects, special effects makeup, and a lot of the concepts I do do get put into makeup effects to some capacity or CG creatures, that sort of thing. Um, I was on a television show called Face Off. This was back in 2012. It's still uh, the new season is actually going to kick start pretty soon. Um, but I was one of the old boys in season two, and somehow I got lucky enough to win that. <coughs> um, it was mostly luck, but here's some of the uh, creatures that I was able to create during that my time on the show. Um, I'm all of these things, okay? Concept artist, world builder, makeup effects artist. Uh, the three bottom ones are my favorite, storyteller, dreamer, and creator. Um, I kind of pride myself on doing a lot of different things and continuously trying to find ways to, to recharge my creative energy and also challenge me. Um, it's hard for me to kind of stay and just do one thing. I like looking at the whole package. So um, yeah, I do a little bit of everything. Uh, Talking about uh, some of my clients, one of my main clients is uh, Adobe, uh, specifically Russell Brown, he's a creative director, and he puts on these really amazing classes. If you guys are serious about Photoshop, you should definitely look into taking one of his courses, they're top of the line, and uh, very theatric. So I'm asked to create characters conceptually and bring them to life um, on stage, and then we do little uh, short videos. Uh, the, uh, coincide with the projects as well. And um, a lot of the students will use these projects for various reasons inside, or, or use these characters for various reasons inside the project. Um, here's a couple other creatures. Well, the one on the left's more of a, of a character, very simple makeup. Um, the one on the right is a ZBrush Kaiju. I also have done some work for theme parks, specifically Universal Studios Japan, and a new park opening up in Utah called Evermore. If you're into fantasy things, uh, definitely the, the right attraction for you. Um, and here's a couple of images I did working with Universal Studios. Got a creature on the right, and then um, a creepy uh, mental patient on the left. And also do some a lot of scenic design and kind of conceptualizing the world. Uh, this was designed in um, Unreal Engine 4, and then used Photoshop over the top to do some compositing. And here's another just kind of nightmarish scene. Um, Hopefully this doesn't disturb any of you. Uh, just kind of a black and white done in Photoshop for Universal Studios. Uh, recently, I do, a lot of the things I do are for um, lower level films. I just got finished with uh, Puppet Master. And it was a year ago and we did a bunch of ZBrush props and um, a lot of the characters' heads and hands were done in ZBrush and we spread them out through the, uh, the states to get them 3D printed. So that was kind of a fun project. And so instead of going with the traditional sculpting and casting and molding, I did 3D prints because 3D printing is becoming more popular. Um, but that's just kind of a brief of why I'm here and why it's okay for me to talk to you, in case you were wondering. Um, but what I really want to show you guys, and I hope that uh, you can walk away learning a couple of tricks in Photoshop, um, is the design process, which is the most important part of what I do, um, especially the uh, lo-fi before the hi-fi. So that's low fidelity before high fidelity, which is a fancy way of saying something that's sketched out before you spend a lot of money producing it to a very high level. And that's kind of where my world sits, and that's where um, the most of the work I do kind of resides. And if I, 
if I didn't do this, if I wasn't accurate and, and speedy with this stuff, then a lot of these higher end productions would, would go to waste or, or be lots of money spent for you know, something, some kind of output that's not that great. So this is me and my friend uh, Logan Long working on Russell, putting this crazy uh, um, character together. Uh, this is referencing to one of the earlier images. But it goes through stages. It goes through this, these sketches, right, in Photoshop. And then once he chooses one, we go with the colored version and make sure we're all good that way before we start into it. Um, another similar process, this is a Shakespearean caveman. So you can see the sketches, the different ideas, and then it goes into color, and then you see the final output and makeup. And just some more kind of photo bashing composites, um, taking the model's faces and kind of drawing over the top of it. Uh, if you look close, they're really loose, you know? Um, they're not ultra refined, and that's kind of the beauty of it, is you can knock these out really fast and, and kind of help spawn that, that visual communication that becomes so important in any kind of production. Um, here's another, this is for one creature, all for the same creature, just different um, paintings and, and compositions to get kind of the look and feel of the character. Uh, you can see this one to the right. It's a ZBrush, that's a ZBrush, this is ZBrush. The other three are Photoshop, just going right into Photoshop. This one I didn't use the sketchbook, but every once in a while I'll still use the, the sketchbook because it's hard to get away from that. Um, and here's a couple other of the more uh, refined ones. So we took some of them to an, an extra level. You know, still very loose, still very conceptual, but getting that visual message across. So, and then what we're going to do today is a, a, I want to talk to you guys about a tool, a very uh, special tool to my workflow. We live in kind of an interesting time right now as creatives and artists where we're getting a lot of these products that are now more mobile and we can take them from one area to another and work while we're doing other things. So we're, we're, we're kind of needed to be able to multitask. We're kind of losing those days where we can go sit in a fancy office and spend most of our day there, you know, at least in the work that I do. And so being able to kind of go around and um, design on the fly becomes really important to me. So HP released the uh, ZBook X2, and that's what I've been using the last few months, and it's been amazing. I have this really nice desktop in my office with a nice Cintiq, um, and I do get to spend a lot of time kind of refining my work and, and doing artwork there, but I, because I have kids and because I have a busy life, I'm actually able to sit down on my couch and use this device, um, and it's, it's been really great. It's got uh, the seventh gen i5, i7s. It's got a GPU, a graphics card in it. So that's allowing me to use a lot of the 3D software that normally I wouldn't be able to use on a laptop. So that's been really cool. Um, Unreal Engine works on this. I can go and navigate a 3D world on it. So even if you're you know, excited about video games, you can also play video games on this thing. But it's been pretty impressive, and I was kind of skeptical at first. And this is coming from an artist. It's been a really um, great device to use. It's got Wacom technology. So um, you guys heard of the Wacom Cintiq? really good for drawing and doing the touch-ups and different things. Well, it uses the same kind of technology on the pen. And so now I'm able to get that same type of response that I have on my Cintiq in my office. So it's really nice and I don't have to, uh, the back and forth is a little more seamless now. Um, it also has these amazing quick keys. I'm going to kind of hold this up. I know it's kind of plugged in right now, but you can see that it's got all these little quick keys that you can program and, and kind of assign keys to, which become really powerful when you're sitting there and ha you do have it on your lap because you don't really have time to use your hotkeys. And um, the nice thing, though, is it does have a removable uh, keyboard. So, I mean, if you do have to set it off to the side and do the more elaborate hotkeys, it's not that big of a deal to set it over and start moving on it. So, um, yeah, this has kind of become my go-to lately, and I've been using it a lot. So I think it's pretty exciting that we get these tools that are coming out that help support the, the artists. And um, so let's jump into what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Um, whether you like it or not, you're going to learn about creature design. <laughs> and more importantly, there's uh, some approaches and workflows in Photoshop that I think you guys might find kind of interesting. So um, yeah, I, I don't see any of you with a, uh, a laptop in your hands, but hopefully you just take really good notes and you can go home and apply this to it. Um, so anyway, I want to talk about realistic proportions. So a lot of what I do, you have to have um, roughly realistic proportions. I will kind of draw through some of these, but when I'm drawing, I'm going to go kind of quick with it. That's why I'm kind of slowing it down right now and, and showing you a little bit more. Um, but basically, we have kind of these guidelines, the way I map out a face so that you can make sure that the proportions are where they need to be. If you look kind of uh, down the center, there's this, there's this oval. And there, I'm going to show you some really cool uh, Photoshop symmetry tools, which are um, a new addition 
addition to the Photoshop uh, interface, um, which will allow you to kind of knock this out pretty fast. But it's really kind of making sure that you're lining things up in the right location because um, those of you who have ever gone on to uh, draw something or even if you're liquefying someone in Photoshop and changing some of their proportions subtle, subtly, um, you have to make sure that you're really careful because one wrong move in one direction can make them look really silly or look like a completely different person. So it's really important to kind of get a base understanding of how proportions work and kind of where they, they should be. And also, not so much in photography, but when you are doing any kind of character or creature design, it's good to add a dynamic expression or, or kind of give a little bit of a personality to them if you can. Um, a lot of times I'll make characters that don't have much of an expression um, because they're monsters and, you know, um, you know, it doesn't really, you don't really care about what they feel or think. Uh, well, depends on who you are, right? Um, but, you know, in most cases, I just try to kind of create a little bit of an attitude or a, a personality to it. So, and another thing I want you guys to pay attention to is I kind of go through my thing, which I'll hit on, but I might just mention secondary forms, primary forms, tertiary forms, and this is what I'm talking about, okay? So when I say that later. Um, but this becomes really important because even in, in, in design in general, everything has to start from kind of this broad stroke and kind of work its way into it. So if you're conceptualizing a composition for even a wedding, let's say, um, you need to kind of think about how lights and, and the values and the different compositions will work with each other and the, the characters will also work within the space too. So, um, and the, everything has to have kind of a lead in to one and the other to kind of maintain that movement throughout a composition. But even on the face, this is this is my composition, right? These are the things, and everything will kind of flow and and um, kind of support some of these other forms. So basically, you have your primary form, which is going to be like the basic structure, right? Which is found in all things. And then you'll have the secondary that's kind of more focused on the nostril. You see how we kind of lift that out a little bit by adding some values and dimension to it. So we're creating that form and allowing it to kind of pop out. It's really the use of of values and, and making sure that there's enough contrast within that value range to create the illusion of dimension, which some of you, you know, may need even right now struggle with trying to create uh, the believability if you are retouching something and just not looking right, it looks too flat maybe. Um, and then the tertiary would be kind of these little lifts and little depressions in the face, these really subtle forms, but everything is supportive of one another. So you can't really have these tertiary forms if you don't have a nostril that kind of would support that kind of lifting up over the top, right? Um, and then the details are just the little pores, the little wrinkles on top. Um, and so if, if you go in and start adding wrinkles or adding kind of noise to a person's face, it's good to know that there's some areas that is just naturally gonna get a little bit more noise because they're supported by these other forms kind of bringing that all together. So it's important to kind of get really uh, geeky on some of these things if you're you know, exploring uh, any kind of creature character design. Um, and then areas of rest and detail become really important as you go. And this is something that's kind of a constant um, principle that you need to kind of keep with you. And the character to the left is not necessarily a bad character, nor is the one in the middle. Um, but the one on the left, you can see there's a lot of high contrast, there's a lot of detail, it's very busy, right? Um, there's not a lot of areas where your eyes can rest and kind of, you know, calm down before it goes into the next movement. Uh, the character in the middle doesn't really have a lot of detail areas, which means there's not a lot of lines that are close together, there's not a lot of high contrast within those lines. And so there's definitely a form there, and it's an interesting character, but it's easy to kind of look at that and then not really care to look at it again because you've captured it, right? Um, versus the one on the left, you could spend there all, all day looking at it and still not be able to identify what's happening. Uh, the one on the far right is kind of a beautiful combination of the two where you have areas that kind of slow down your eyes and then other areas that kind of speed it up. It also creates kind of a natural movement in and around the face too. It kind of leads into one thing and leads out of another. And this is called like a gradient. Have you guys ever heard the term gradient? I've seen it in Photoshop a few times? Well, it applies to everything in life. You know, there's uh, trees outside that have this larger support and then it goes to these branches and these little leaves. Everything kind of has this exhaustion of energy. And so in your compositions, whether it's characters or something not related to creatures or characters at all, be thinking about how these little pieces and parts will flow in, how you can use contrast and different values to bring things to life and create an interest in the scene. And so now let's jump into Photoshop. There's kind of the basic introduction. And basically by the end of this little session, uh, we're gonna create something like what you see up here. 
three different examples. You see they're, they're all kind of loose, right? Um, and the goal is that you should be able to knock these out, ideally within 20, 30 minutes. Um, and if you could do that, you could send that to the, the client. They can you know, look at it and say yay or nay, and then you can move on. And if you do have to throw something away like this, it's not that big of a deal because you didn't spend a ton of time on it. right? Uh, much more depressing if you spend three full days working on something and your client says this isn't going to work. right? So if you can get kind of these little sketches done um, and have them communicate most of the idea, you'll be in pretty good shape. So let's start off with a document, and I'm just going to do a five by seven portrait style. And if you go into Edit and Preferences, there's something called the Technology Previews. And in this little window, you'll see uh, Enable Paint Symmetry. By default, it's selected off. Um, but you can click that on, and then what'll happen is when you do have a brush selected, it'll show up there at the top, and it looks like a little butterfly. This is really cool because you can do a lot of different um, patterns and have symmetry kind of rotate on something wavy even. Uh, for this one, we're just going to use the basic vertical line and hit Enter once we have it where we want it. And then go ahead and select like a mid-gray color, hit Alt Backspace, which will just fill that in. And then I'm going to create a new layer. And from here, I'm going to draw out some realistic proportions using kind of like um, a basic soft brush. A lot of the brushes I use are very simple. And you can do anything with, with a really simple brush. It's just really knowing kind of where to put it. I think the most elaborate brush I have is the smudge tool. And I'll kind of describe that here in a second of, of why I use it and how I use it. Um, so go ahead and come in and just create kind of a basic oval. And then you've got kind of this line down the middle, but if you're using symmetry, you don't necessarily have to use the line in the middle, right? Um, and what I try to do is you'll find kind of the middle of this oval, and I'll try to hike it up just a little bit. If you hold down the Shift button, you can create kind of a perfect line going across the top. And then I'll try to think of where the half point would be in between this bottom half, and once again, just kind of hike it up a little bit to where it's somewhere in there, and then there'll be kind of a midline in this bottom section, and I'll just hike that up a little bit and draw that over the top. And then what I'm going to do is look at, I'm going to create a couple eyes. And what I want is five eyes across. You guys have maybe seen this before. Um, so what I'll do is try to find just a little oval in the center and one off to the side, and then another one. Uh, obviously, using symmetry, it makes that pretty easy, but you're looking for about the eye width to be about the same to get almost a perfect five across. And what you're going to do is just focus on these two of the normal eye placement, just kind of darken them out a little bit. And then about that same size, I'll actually draw another little eye shape on top of that first line. And then on the next one, I'll draw it right down the center. And what I can do with this is create little nostrils on the sides, kind of pull down the eyes here. Uh, from about the middle of the eyes down is where I'll have my mouth start, the corners of my mouth. And then I'll create a little bit more weight down there at the bottom of, of this side of that little oval. And then I'll typically have the corners of the eyes kind of match up with the outsides of the nostrils. And I'll take the ears, and the top of the ear I'll have be about the middle of the eye, and then the bottom of the ear be located on that same nose line. And so right now I have some basic proportions of a head to get started, which is pretty cool. Um, obviously you can go and like change this up, because everyone does have different proportions, right? If you're, especially if you're trying to have it look like someone. Um, but what's neat about this is, um, and I'll show you this a little bit later, is you can go into Liquify and kind of move some things around. And they've actually added some really cool things to Liquify to help out with that. So let's go ahead and make a little bust. And what I like to do, this I use this as just kind of a guide. So I'm going to lighten that up, and I'm going to make a new layer. And I'm going to choose a brush that has a little bit more of a hard edge to it instead of kind of the soft brush. 
that I was using earlier. I like using the soft brushes to sketch out ideas because it, 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 the looseness of it kind of keeps me from getting too detailed too early. Have you guys ever ran into that? We just start looking at the details because they're kind of fun to play around with and the next thing you realize you're not really making very good headway on it. So I'm gonna dial down my brush a little bit and then this is where we're gonna start turning this thing into a monster. So um, I think it's only fitting to do something demonic, right? Since we're at B and H, does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> no contrast there. Uh, Big brain. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, We'll create a little contrast because I'm sure that uh, B and H hasn't seen a lot of demons created in their, you know, work. <laughs> so we'll have some fun with it. But we see a lot of monsters that are demon-like in the, a lot of our movies. So what I'm doing is um, just kind of identifying some landmarks in the face that might be interesting to kind of uh, pull out a little bit. We'll give it some nice little pointy ears and maybe drop the lobes a little bit. But you see how they kind of use the template underneath and I can just kind of explore some different options. So I can do you know, a few more layers of this just to kind of see what I come up with. And as long as your basic foundation is good, it makes this really easy, especially with the symmetry applied. So, and then I'll come in, let's do some cool horns. The nice thing about symmetry is you can sit there and um, kind of see the other side build as you go, and sometimes you see a better relationship between the two horns, which when you're doing one horn at a time, a time sometimes you kind of lose that. So, and we'll add another horn in here just because it, it looks interesting. Um, and also remember what I said about gradients, right? Um, larger items moving into smaller items. So even with the horns, it's a good idea to be thinking about that. So if you have smaller horns that kind of lead into larger horns and then drop back down into smaller horns, that's natural. That's something we see in all kinds of creatures on this planet. Um, so you're not, even though you're creating a creature that doesn't exist, you're not necessarily wrong. There's kind of a truthfulness to it. So add another horn, maybe a bump. You see how it kind of steps down a little bit. Um, can throw in some wrinkles. We'll be changing a lot of these as we go, so we don't. We can still stay pretty loose with it. Kind of play around with the lip. Maybe give kind of an indent there. And maybe that kind of rolls down into something on the chin. We'll angle out the the jawbone a little bit, um, just because that's a little bit scary, right? makes it a little more uh, villain-like. Okay, so we have something like this, and this is what we will use to move forward on. Like I said, you can choose a bunch of different shapes and play around with it, it's up to you, and that's kind of the, the fun part of this. Um, and then the next thing I wanna do is fill this in. So I want to work with the silhouette that I can paint from. And so what I'll do is hit the W button, which will be the magic wand, and then hit Shift Control I, which will invert that selection. And then I'm gonna go and select my, my gray background and hit Control J. And if you look, it'll actually create a perfect little clean silhouette with an alpha channel on the outside. And it's the same color gray, that's why it's not showing up. But if I hit Control U, I can go and slide that down and make it a little bit darker. I don't want this to be completely black, but I want it to be pretty dark so that I can play around with it a little bit and create some different values. So we'll start there. And I can actually go ahead and get rid of my, my template underneath. And what I like to do is I, I tend to be very destructive. So I have this nice little sketch that I'm, I'm using to work off of. Well, now I, I choose not to like it anymore because I, I want those values to be able to kind of blend in with, with the silhouette. So what I'm gonna do is hit Control E, which is going to collapse that into it. I'm gonna destruct that. And then I'm gonna go up, this little button right here has become my best friend, this little lock transparencies button. And what this allows you to do is that if I want to go and draw on this, I can scribble all over it and it doesn't do anything to the outside of it. It kind of keeps it in that nice little container. So um, I really like working off of this. Instead of doing a selection tool where you see the little dancing ants, you don't have to visually see anything. You just know that it's working for you because the, the, uh, this little lock button is selected. Okay, so we've got our primary forms. Um, we've actually, because we were sketching, we actually came in and brought in some tertiary and some secondary as well. But I need to refine those using value. That becomes a really important part of this. Um, value in anything becomes um, 
really, really important the more you kind of uh, mess with it and the more you use it. So let's go ahead and access these other tools real quick. And I'm going to grab my soft brush again. This can be any soft brush. There's nothing overly special about this. And I'm going to choose kind of a lighter tone gray. And what I'm going to do is start painting something uh, called ambient occlusion, which is everything, every form has some kind of a highlight and some kind of a shadow, right? If it's moving in any direction, it's going to, ha it's going to support a shadow and a highlight. And it doesn't necessarily mean anything um, it's not really related to the overall light source. Obviously, you can change the direction of a light, which will blow out some of the shadows, right? But in most lighting situations, there's kind of these soft shadows around these forms, and they become really important. So what I try to do is I'm not, I'm not locking into any light source in particular. I'm just coming in and creating kind of an, a, a nice little highlight in between some of my line work. It might look kind of funny right now, but I'll show you what we're going to do with it. It'll be kind of fun. Okay, just kind of creating a sense of dimension. Um, then I'm going to blow this up even bigger and kind of pull out the primary dimension a little bit more. So my forehead and my cheekbones a little bit. Um, you can also use the dodge and burn tool on this. The only problem with dodge and burn is it doesn't work with symmetry, so you'd have to do a lot of it by yourself, uh, which is fine. So I, uh, typically with a brush, I work with um, just the uh, soft brush to kind of get these basic forms working for me. And then what I'll do is I'll actually turn off the symmetry because the next tool I'm going to be using doesn't really work with symmetry either, and that is the smudge tool. This is my best friend. So. And the, and the way I use a smudge tool is a little bit different than the default. Um, if you look at coloring, if you're, if you're retouching skin even, there's this unevenness that's natural, right? There's a subsurface scattering of texture that happens naturally in almost everything. Even if you're taking a picture of a home, just naturally the way it kind of ages, there's a scattering of, of information. And so what I try to do is set up my smudge tool so where it'll take some of these values and they'll start to blend them in a way that doesn't feel airbrushed, that actually feels more realistic. And the way I have that set up is if I go into my brush information, I've got the shape dynamics, uh, excuse me, I, got, I have a set to scatter, so I throw in a little bit of scattering to it. And then in my transfer, I do a little bit of a jitter. Um, and I have my pen pressure kind of working with it. And then I also do an angle jitter in my shape dynamics. Okay, so these are just three simple things that you can do with the, the smudge tool. And then what you get from it is, I'll zoom in is it creates kind of this, size it down a little bit more, this kind of painterly blend between the values. And so instead of spending all, all day trying to get this perfect, I can just come in and scrub this around a little bit and look what it's doing. It doesn't feel too airbrushed. It has kind of a painterly look to it. You see how it starts to separate and kind of blotches it out. It's really good for characters, but even if you're using it on touching up someone's face, even if they have great makeup on, you'll be amazed at what this kind of painterly look can do um, in some of the beginning stages of it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just kind of blowing through this and getting some of these areas blended. I'll probably focus more on one side of the face as we go through this, just so you don't have to watch me do things over too much. But I'll at least get the eyes. We'll get underneath this eye. Um, and you can notice that I'll kind of drag and pull. And the technique I'm using is I'll touch down the middle and kind of do this at first, and then I'll kind of pull the light values in or pull the black values in so I can still reshape it. I still have a lot of control. It's not just a, this. I think it, sometimes it looks like it's overly random, but uh, there, there is a little sense of control. So the more you use the tool, the more a lot of this will kind of make sense. Kind of get through some of these a little bit faster. Obviously, the ears aren't overly important. Just kind of focus on the face. Get 
these little wrinkles figured out a little bit more. Once again, just still using that same technique, a lot of scribbling going on. And then after I do this, I will move over into the dodge and burn and just try to pull out some of these dimensions a little bit more to make them more believable. So we'll start in on the forehead, I'll size my brush down a little bit. Just kind of run this in between some of these areas. And this is where I'm focusing more on those tertiary forms we talked about. If I have little areas where I want to bring out the dimension, this is where I'm going to do that. And we can keep this on its own layer, so we can always go back and revisit this as we go. And if you notice, I'm still applying this to all of the areas of the face, because I haven't really locked into any one light source just yet. I'm still kind of identifying just the tertiary forms and making sure that I'm giving a little bit of dimension to all the areas on the face. And once I do that, kind of sculpt out some anatomy here on the chest, just to give it something to play around with. Then I'm going to dial up my brush size. Because I have the transparency lock on there, I can get, make my brush size really big. And um, it works really good for the soft brush. If you're messing around with the soft brush, sometimes the bigger you go with that brush, the cleaner you can make some transitions. And so now I'm going to focus on the lighting itself. Um, I can do this in a different layer. I can keep it on the same layer. I typically like to keep it on the same layer because um, by smashing things together, purposely destroying my layers, it keeps it loose in my, in my brain. If I, if I have 200 layers on it, I get really meticulous, and I almost think that they're more special than they really are. So, um, so here we're going to be a little bit destructive with it. And I'm just going to go in and just kind of create a light source. I'm going to hold down the Alt button, which will do the opposite, which will start burning at that a little bit. Okay, so I'm creating kind of a, a sense of a key light here. So already we have something that has some dimension to it. It's not perfect, but it's kind of interesting, right? We, we could, if we had to, if the client was, hey, give me a five minute sketch, I need to see if this is gonna work or not, this would work, right? At least, at least a starting point for, for that really good communication when you are designing things. Um, but I need a little bit more to it. And so what I'm gonna do is I can go take a little bit of a soft brush. So I, I still have my soft brush selected. And you guys have may, maybe used this when you're retouching photos, but you grab a, a mid-range value and you just really lightly kind of start to swallow that in in some areas. And what you're doing is kind of creating a little bit of a break between the harsh contrast of some of the forms because you can get a little too heavy with your dark values and you can get a little too heavy with your white where they start blowing out. And so sometimes just a little softening of that mid-range value will just kind of tone things down, which can be really important. Um, at the same time, you might need to uh, punch up a few areas. Uh, one thing I love to do is hit the L button while I have the uh, transparency lock on and um, do some airbrushing after I've gone through and selected some of the areas of my creature. Because what this does, especially with something on one layer, is it can create really nice cast shadows. And it creates this really sharp edge to it, which can work really well because, um, especially with the nose and the jaw, you do have some pretty harsh contrast. There's a little bit of a fall off. Um, but in most cases, it's a, it's a pretty good cast shadow. So let's do that again to the nose. Gonna come in there, make it a little bit wider. Just really lightly kind of pull that in, press down a little bit, and pull off, and you see that there's a little bit of a shadow in there. So you can use the lasso tool. You can also just go and use the airbrush. Um, there's another technique is you can use the airbrush and tighten it up a little bit and use some cross hatching and hatching techniques if you're an old school sketch artist. And if you hold down the Alt button, you can select some of those lighter tones. So these are just scribbles, right? They look like sketches. Um, but instead of spending a bunch of time with the soft brush and doing this back and forth and getting 
irritated that I'm not softer enough, soft enough with my hands, I can use that smudge tool and come in and just really carefully just kind of glide that over the top. And it's much easier to do this than to try to be overly um, precise with a soft brush. Even with these great you know, tools that we have, um, now you're working with the tools and the software, right? So it's trying to find that right combination. So anyway, you can come in here and start sharpening up a lot of these forms to create a, a lot of different looks and, and uh, you know, the right kind of uh, believability to this dimension. So the next thing I want to do is create a lot of really cool details, right? So pores and wrinkles and that sort of thing, because what's more monstrous than having a bunch of cool stuff happening on your face, right? But you have to be careful with details, because um, if it's too detailed, if you remember what we were talking about with the, the balance of rest and detailed areas, it can be too busy, right? So what I like to do is I'm going to use a soft brush again, just a simple soft brush. I'm going to go down to kind of a darker gray, and I'm actually going to turn on symmetry. You can select last use symmetry. And I'm just going to kind of draw an ugly line in there just so we can see how it's going to perform. Um, I'm going to double click to the right side of the layer, which is going to open up the layer styles. And I'm going to choose bevel and emboss. And what this is going to do is create the illusion that there's a little bit of depth. So I want the highlight to be on the bottom side of the stroke and then the shadow to kind of dip in. And that's why I, I am going to switch this over to soft light as a, the blend mode here in a second. Um, and so you can play around with the uh, opacity a little bit. You can play around with the size, obviously. Now we're getting into secondary forms, tertiary forms, working their, their way down into details. So I want it just to kind of give me a subtle lift, because I'm still going to be using the brush to perform and make this look good. Um, and I've got a little bit of a shadow in there as well. So this might actually be OK to start off. Um, I am going to switch this over to a soft light. If you notice on the soft light, it just allows some of the information from underneath to come through a little more naturally. And the next thing I'm going to do is go into, sorry, let me go back into my layer styles, into blending options. Um, they have these really nice transparency sliders. And what I'm going to do is on the underlying layer, I'm going to hold down Alt and kind of spread and pull this. And you're not really going to be able to see what it's doing right now. Um, but if I stroke over the top of the eye, if you look in this little shadow spot, it's not creating a highlight. And that becomes really important, because if you have a highlight in an area that's shadowed, um, it doesn't really make sense, right? So by doing that, it just says, OK, anything at a certain value range, I'm going to ignore completely. And you don't have to worry about me giving you an, an unrealistic uh, highlight. OK, so these look kind of bad. We'll erase those. We have that layer set up the way we want it. And so just like I was telling you before, we have to make sure that if we're putting wrinkles in, that they have a source, kind of a supporting element for them to kind of pull from. So we'll kind of try to find some of these wrinkles and bring them up over the top. We can use these little X patterns, just create some cool creature texture. I'm being really light-handed with this because I don't want it to be too dark. Because if it's too dark, then we get too much contrast, and that makes it too busy, right? So we can have kind of a surface texture and then push down a little bit harder in some of these areas around the eyes. And if the cool thing about this layer, if it's not quite where you want it, you can go in and make some adjustments to the size. So we'll go to two. Go back, go back into that. And we can change the depth, which is going to give us a little bit different highlight. We can also change the angle as to where the highlight would actually be coming from. And so typically, you'd want to kind of direct this towards the key light. We'll brighten up that highlight a little bit more. Maybe add a little bit more depth to it until we get something that's working a little bit better. And then we can continue to just go over the top and draw some kind of fun little wrinkles, some skin texture, be a little bit more assertive in these areas that have supporting forms. Be really light-handed on those areas that of those forms that are kind of more projected. And 
we'll kind of come down on these um, jaw bones and just create more of an intense texture just so you guys can see a little bit better. Create some lines on the lips. A little, too much texture can sometimes, uh, especially how you see it now, it's a little bit too symmetrical. So it starts to look a little unnatural, right? This, this is the time where you probably take off the symmetry and kind of just have some fun with it. Um, we can also go up into the horns and do all kinds of fun stuff. This also works for, you know, if you're trying to create moles on a character, you just flip, you just invert the light and where it's coming from. But stuff like this can create really cool, interesting shapes on the horns with just a few simple strokes. Um, let's go and add a little bit to the neck, just so it doesn't feel left out. We'll do these little X's. And then also, just like we were talking about, if you have areas where it's a little bit larger cells or, or scales like this, and they lead into something smaller, it feels a little bit more natural. That's kind of a cooler look to it. You can also kind of treat that the same way up here, maybe around the horn, that site where the horn comes out. There's these little scales that come out of the creature. But do you see how simple this is and how easy it is to just go and draw and kind of experiment? And if I don't like something, I can just erase it because it's on its own layer. So now I'm not being destructive, right? I'm, I'm being a, a good boy. Um, but in no time, you can have something that's textured up and looks pretty neat. Um, some of these areas that are pretty hard still, you can go in and do more smudging to, you know, if they're starting to kind of take away from the, the look and feel of your character, which some of those are, absolutely. And you can even go in at this level and do more dodge and burning too. I'm on this bottom layer and just see how it aids in some of the wrinkles and some of the fine details that you pulled in. See if you can get it to look a little bit better. You can use the dodge and burn, or you can use the airbrush to kind of create this. It's up to you. OK, so now let's look at creating um, color. So the nice thing about this is, is if you spend a lot of time on the values, it really gives you a lot of control. Um, and the color, if you have it set up right, will only make everything you did on the other layers look that more amazing, right? Um, so what you can do, and by the way, if you hold down the Alt button in between the bevel and emboss layer, it'll lock into those same transparencies that are happening on the bottom layer, and it's its, it's parent layer, and you can do the same thing to this new layer that we added. And this we're actually going to set to a soft light. I like basing colors out in soft light a little bit more than I like using overlay because overlay is dependent on values and actually blow out your values sometimes, where soft light's a little bit uh, more respectful of the values you do have. And so let's go ahead and for fun, we'll make this kind of a greenish character. I try not to get overly um, saturated with my colors when I am applying something because that's one of the first mistakes is taking everything and saturating the, the it, it to a degree where it just starts to look awful. You guys have probably accidentally done that sometimes. Um, it's better to kind of stay in kind of this muted tone to get all of your values and transitions kind of figured out. And then kind of the last little sprinkle on top is when you start to hit it with some of the high saturated elements and it tends to look a little bit better. Um, OK, so we've got kind of a base color in there. And then I'm also going to go to my adjustment layers and add a gradient map. You guys ever played with these? Yeah. They're kind of fun. We'll use uh, the purple orange one. Uh, there's a lot of different types of complementary colors. It just takes a color and overlays it into the darker values. And the lighter values, it, it adds another color to it. Um, and I like to have this at the top of my stack. And what it does is just kind of keeps everything and kind of harmonizes the colors that you are using and kind of almost like it creates a, a sense of believability within the elements, right? It's kind of a broad stroke of, of a world on top of whatever you put underneath. So we'll kind of use this purple tone. And um, you can see how it starts to pull some of the values and brighten them up a little bit. So I just want to drop down the opacity 
so that it's just kind of laying in there in a soft way. And you can still see that green come through, right? But it just it looks a little bit better with the background. Um, on the note of a background, let's try to add some dimension to this so it doesn't feel so flat. It's just kind of a quick little fix. Um, dial up the size of your dodge and burn tool. Hold down the Alt button. And you can create a little bit of a darkened border. And you can also, without the, the Alt button depressed, you can draw out some dodging of that color. And you can see that the background's starting to be a little bit more interesting for us. And you can also see those colors come through and, and see actually how the, the green contrasts a little bit. Or you, actually, I should say you notice the green a little bit more. Um, OK, so we've got that. Let's go ahead and add another layer. And we can hold down the Alt button so that it stays connected to that shape. And here is where we can add some additional colors. I'm actually going to switch this to Multiply, because I don't want these doing anything with the values. And let's go, we've still got our soft brush selected. Got symmetry applied. So I'm going to go in and grab some red tones. Because if you have a character that's all one flat color, it can look kind of fake after a while. Okay, and it's really kind of the illusion of skin and that depth that skin naturally has is what we're trying to create. And just naturally, we are, there are some different zoning. There's some undertones that happen in skin. Um, so this is an opportunity to come in and throw that in there. You can also find um, some really great texture brushes out there or spatter brushes. And if you use these the right way, you can create kind of spots on the skin which can be kind of cool. You guys are see is that coming through OK? Yeah. Um, and I typically like to, if I am using any kind of a breakup of the skin, I like to use um, all the colors on the color wheel, at least all the, the primary colors. So I try to do something that's blue, yellow, and red, just because it, as I start to relight it with different types of gradient maps, it'll, it'll respect some of those colors coming through. And it just feels like it has a better color balance overall. So um, you can do a lot with just having the right kind of texture in there. Um, and we'll also get some yellowish tones in there just to kind of make it a little bit more interesting for us. So cool, we've got some fun little textures in there. It's already starting to look a little bit like skin. And then we're going to open up another layer. Hold down the Alt button in between, it'll lock it down. And we're going to set this one to a color dodge. And what we're going to do is go back to our airbrush, our soft brush. I call it the airbrush, I'm sorry. And I'm going to choose kind of an orangish red color. And we're going to add something called subsurface scattering. Um, have you guys ever heard that term before? It's, it's where light comes through the skin, and it starts to, it, as it gets through the first couple layers, it starts to bounce around. And you see some of the, uh, there, there's like this illusion of depth that starts to occur. You can actually see something internal. And um, it's really, you, you, where you would mostly see it is if someone has their back towards the light of a, like a sun or any other kind of light source, and it comes through the ear, and it creates that orangish red. Well, that's kind of everywhere. It's just more noticeable in some of these areas that get blown out. So sometimes even when you, when you put a bunch of makeup on people, it'll start to hide maybe some of the real depth in their face, and that's what creates kind of this fake look. But as you're doing photo retouches, the same thing can happen. Sometimes you can add so much to it that you start to lose that, that subsurface scattering, that natural occurrence of light bouncing around the surface. So I'm going to try to create that illusion on a, on a monster. So first step is getting the right color. And the next step is making sure you put it in the right spots. And one of the, the most noticeable things that um, subsurface scattering can do, and I'm actually going to uh, drop down the flow a little bit just because I'm being a little heavy handed with this. Um, you'll see it a little bit in the horns. Well, and what it's doing is it's taking the, the lighter values, when you select uh, color dodge, it's taking the lighter values, or the darker values, 
and it's lightening them up a little bit with the color that you chose. So it's taking the value of the color and lifting it a little bit, which is really what is what happening. It's what's happening when you see that light come through the ear. Is it's taking all of that dimension that would normally, based off of how you lit it, would create some really dark shadows in the ear. Um, it's actually softening that a little bit because light is bouncing through the ear, which would start to combat the shadows, right? So that makes sense. So we need to create that illusion and allow for some of that to pull through. We also typically will see the subsurfing, subsurface um, reds happen on a, an area that's recently shadowed, which is it's kind of hard to explain. But So I have a shadow coming from the left side to the right, right? And right before it starts to darken on this back side of this cheekbone, there's going to be this little s subtle, subtle line of subsurface scattering as the light has kind of reached its max distance and b before it turns into the shadow. I know that's really, you know, <laughs> it's really in depth there, but it's something to pay attention to because if you can start to, even on your car your, uh, your photo retouches, you can come through and kind of just look for that. Look for moments where you can just kind of soften that in a little bit, use a color that you probably wouldn't normally color use, and you'll find some really interesting results from it. So um, it's a little bit strong in some areas, but we can always add a layer mask to it. You know, kind of calm some of these areas down. It's very subtle, so being in control with it is, is the most important thing. And then if you like what you see, you can right-click and hit Apply Layer Mask, and then it just kind of collapses on it. Um, I try to do that whenever I can, try to destruct that layer as much as I possibly can. Um, let's actually go through, I'm actually going to paint over that same layer just for fun, that green layer that we have our character on. And I'm going to give this demon some yellow eyes. And I'll show you how to pop those out here in a second. OK, so we have some uh, scattering of light. Um, got some texture in there. We have some base colors. Uh, the colors themselves are not overly elaborate, but you can see how just the subtlety you start to bring it together, and it looks believable, right? Um, now, it's I might go back and forth, and believe me, this is kind of a back and forth thing where you go through and you see if you can kind of punch up some of these values and make this character pop a little bit more by doing some more dodge and burn on that other layer. Just see if you can kind of pull some of those out a little bit, and you can see we're just slowly starting to kind of pull that out. And what we're doing is creating that primary depth, right? Shadows back here, the highlights back there. And that's what's creating that believability of dimension. Sometimes if you're overworking an uh, image too much, you can flatten it out where you lose that value. And it, it'll sit there and haunt you. And you think it's color, but it's actually not. It's actually more has to do with the values. So um, something to, to really pay attention to as you go. And then the, uh, the last few layers. We're going to do uh, some final lighting. And uh, this is going to be kind of like a three-point lighting system. So I want um, a backlight or, or a kind of a rim light actually kind of coming through the backside here. And my fill light is going to be a lot of these soft shadowing, these little soft lights kind of coming through on the backside. And then we already have kind of our key light, right? Um, so, but I want to pay attention to two different things. One of them is the materials, to make sure that the materials themselves are looking appropriate within the light space, which is something that it's easy to forget about, is that even if you have a key light on something, every single material collects light and, and works with light a little bit differently, right? Um, so it's important to understand the specularity of of some of these materials, it's important to understand the roughness, okay, how, how that roughness is kind of um, protecting that specularity and not allowing light to refract or bounce off of certain objects a certain way. And if you start thinking in terms of material, it makes it a lot easier to start to light and, and create a better, more believable dimensional item within a space. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up a new layer, and I'll just keep this one to uh, just a normal layer. And I know that there's a certain level of specularity and glossiness that is going to occur. I'm going to take off the symmetry quick. This is going to occur on the eyes especially, right? We see that little light. Sometimes we can change our light sources to create different types of um, shapes on the eye, right? Uh, with this monster, I'm not overly concerned as to what the actual lights look like, but I just know I need a specularity on there. So I'm going to give a couple of different lights on there with my soft brush. 
dial up the size of my soft brush. Uh, one technique I like to employ when I am creating um, a glow is I'll use a larger soft brush and just kind of tap down really softly to create that, that um, fall off of that light, of that uh, reflection, and then I'll come down and tighten the, uh, the brush and be a little bit more uh, refined with it. It's a combination of the two that cre creates that believability. Some people will try to do one or the other and it, it won't quite work for them. So a little bit of a combination. Um, and I've also, I'm gonna alt click on the nose and I'm not gonna go pure white on this. I'm actually just gonna kind of bump it up a little bit using the colors that it already has. And I can come through and create some nose texture kind of scribble in some dimension where that key light might be exhausting itself. And you can see that it's real scribbly right now, but I'll, I'm going to use our, my favorite brush in the whole world. That's the smudge tool, right? So I'm going to come over the top with that. And I'm not going to do it everywhere. I'm just going to grab the edges of these little sketch sketches that I did and just pull them out a little bit. And that's going to be enough to kind of create this, this you know, balance to a lot of these sketch looking uh, strokes that I have. So you kind of allow the inside to still be kind of directed and assertive, and then you soften out the edges and it, it has a really nice look to it. So we'll come in, give ourselves a little bit of a, a highlight around the eye. And lips typically will be a little bit more wet. Could be a character with dry lips, that's okay too. But trying to think of where the light would actually be hitting and you have to you know, go 3D in your brain and try to think of how this lip is actually shaped. Because if it kind of has a little bit of a more angle to it, it'll just be the top part that might reflect the right way. If it has a more of a base to it and it really starts to project, then you might see that highlight kind of rotate downward. Um, more around this side of the lip. Kind of like how we have the bottom lip, it'll collect a little bit more light. And when you're painting lights, really try to think of your strongest light that you're going to be painting is going to be perpendicular to the light source. So if, you're, if you have a curve, and if your light source is up here, at the top of that curve, that's where it's going to be the strongest, the brightest hot spot. And as it starts to rotate around that that surface, it starts to lose energy, right? So if you kind of keep that in mind, and there's all these little tertiary forms, right? We've identified that there's these little forms that are protruded, so they're all going to work with light a little bit differently, and a lot of that has to do with how it's angled towards light. So we'll have that in there. We'll go through and kind of sketch on the, the chin a little bit. This isn't going to be overly wet on the chin. I mean, it's your character design, so I guess you can kind of say what it is, but. Um, on these areas where there's going to be a certain level of roughness, I might come in and kind of sketch. And you see I'm kind of jumping around and thinking about the texture underneath, how that might hide some of the, the surface area. But I can come in and I can still use that color, but just be a little bit more aggressive with my smudge tool. These are just sketch marks. I'm turning them into something that's a little bit different. So you kind of see how that works? Um, we're starting to pay attention to the materials, right? We're thinking about the materials. Not everything is going to react the same way. So that's giving you some, uh, some know-how there when you start to create these things. Top of the uh, cheekbone on this side, we'll go ahead and scribble at that a little bit. Just go and kind of dance around. Very quick process. But notice how if I, if I were to go take this airbrush and just kind of bring it up all the way and not be, be paying attention to the forms, it'll look really unnatural, look really fake, it'll look airbrushed, right? But, but thinking about how the texture, this erratic movement, this erratic behavior with the stylus um, is actually working for me. And even in, you're the most beautiful person in the world with the most perfect makeup, it's still good for you to think of how these erratic moments can and do happen even in something that, that looks perfect. Because if you, if you do that, if you employ that, you'll notice that um, everything will, will look better and it'll be one of those things well, that people will ask you, is that, is that photoshopped? Because their mind is telling them that there are imperfections there, but um, it still looks good. And that's a good spot to be in, you know? Okay, so I'm just going to kind of dance on a couple more of these. Uh, 
we're going to touch on the rim light here next. And something to kind of keep in mind with the rim light is there's a couple different ways to do it. I typically go highly stylized and I be, I'm really assertive with the rim light. Um, but that's more for the style that I like to go with. Some of you might want a softer rim light, so you might employ some different techniques. Um, so you may or may not like the one that I show you here in a second. Um, also, I'm going to grab some of this atmosphere light, which is right now kind of a pinkish orange. And once I have that selected, I'm just going to kind of bump it up a little bit. And I'm looking for bounce lights right now. So. I'm assuming that there's this atmosphere to this character's world and that some areas are going to be able to catch that environment, especially around the eyes. So this bottom part of both of the eyes, I'm going to come in really subtle and just kind of create a little bit of a, of a, of a light source in there. Um, you can see it's, it's super subtle, but it matters, right? It, it creates that sense of something spherical that has a certain level of moisture to it, and so it's responding to the environment. And that's really all part of this believability is, is being able to identify your environment and understand how um, you know, sit, different lighting systems would work. Um, right here on the corner of the nose, it really depends on how far it's pushed out from the face, right? Sometimes we have that fold that comes down. This is a monster, but um, I, didn't, I didn't draw one of those in, but it probably still has some kind of a little bit of a recess there, so that means that the bounce light probably wouldn't be able to attach itself to it. So, so I may need to, to get rid of that one or do something else that's a little bit different. Something that's shiny is going to indicate whether you know, there is that light source. And, and even here, I didn't have the backside of this lip fully created, but I can start to shape that out with just thinking about the bounce lights. OK, so just kind of bring those in a little bit. And um, that's, this is all on the same layer. And typically, the bounce lights I'd, I'd actually have on a different layer. But I am going to make another layer. And this is the one I will have as my rim light. So similar to the bounce lights, there's probably a light source that's um, similar to what we have in this environment. However, sometimes I default to just a blue light source, you know, because I, I think it looks good with most of the characters. So um, if you see a lot of my stuff, you'll, you'll see a blue uh, bounce light on there. And if you are going to use a blue bounce slide, I, I just recommend maybe dropping it underneath the gradient map so it still kind of pulls it together. Um, for this one, I will use kind of a more orangish color because we have that pinkish orange in our scene already. Um, by keeping it on its own layer, though, you can actually control you know, how intense it is and even what color. And what I'm going to do here is just like how we look at uh, photography and trying to uh, shape out objects, is I'm looking to identify some of these areas on the back side that you can't really see because of how intense the shadow is. So if I can come in and, and add some clues to my client as to what might be happening on that side of the face, what are some of the tertiary forms that might be picked up by this rim light. It might be a little bit stronger, even though I had kind of a bounce light already there. We're going to say that the rim light will actually kind of peek around the corner. And once again, it's, it follows the same rules, the same physical rules of uh, as the light starts to wrap and fall away from the light, it starts to soften. Okay, so it might be kind of strong on this back side where it's going to be a little bit more noticeable, a little bit closer. But then as it starts to rotate around, that's where you're going to see it start to soften a little bit. Right now I'm using little sketch marks. Why do you think I'm using sketch marks? Because I'm going to smudge it. My favorite tool. That's right. So this can be a lot of fun. But whenever I can employ the technique of just sketching, then I'm having a lot more fun doing the artwork, but also um, I'm faster. I'm moving. You know? And I think that's something to kind of think about is try to move as fast as you can. There are times where you have to kind of slow down, um, but typ typically it's after this point, after you've kind of 
you know, solidified your, your basic uh, lighting solutions, you know how all the surfaces are reacting, then you can go in and kind of be a little bit more meticulous and spend some time just really refining. But these concepts still carry through. Even through all the detail, the, the high fidelity stuff that you do, the, the concepts are still there. They're just a little bit more controlled, a little bit tighter, okay? So we'll pull that out. Might get a little bit of a rim bounce up in here. Kind of crawl through some of these uh, details a little bit. And then here comes the uh, smudge tool, allowing there to be kind of some strength areas in between, which will create the illusion of texture. But some areas where it starts to kind of fall off and create kind of a different look. Especially right here as it starts to roll across different surfaces. And it can just be a little bit of this back and forth where you go and soften it, brush it out, do it again, come back over it. Um, I'm actually going to grab this color and go a little bit brighter with it now and just kind of pick and choose a few spots that I want to be a little bit brighter based off of its location to the light. I'm going to say that the light source is down here. So I might have some moments in there that create a little bit more of a hot spot. Not fully white, but you know, something I can use to apply a levels adjustment later too that I can still kind of control how powerful it is. And if you want to get really crazy, uh, you can create kind of a glow to it. And what I like to do is use the We'll open up a new layer. And this is kind of a fun little trick. I'm actually gonna fill this in with, let's actually use the, the actual background color. And we'll switch this over to Linear Dodge Add. And we'll apply a mask to that. And we're gonna fill this whole thing in with black. Because what we're gonna do is now paint with white and choose our areas that we want to kind of have that bloom of light. So. Choose my brush. And have white selected. And we'll just kind of come through, and just kind of ride the edge a little bit, and just kind of let that float in between the two lines, and you get kind of this, this cool little bloom of light. This might be kind of intense, it kind of romanticizes it a little bit, but you know, for a character you're trying to sell, it makes some sense, right? make it look cooler than it is. Um, but you can see as I turn that on and off, it's fine without. But sometimes that nice little bloom can create a cool effect. And the, the couple things I do, though, is I'm, I'm using the light that's in the scene, you know, something that I know is there. And uh, linear dodge uh, tends to kind of amplify the light. So you don't want to go too light, otherwise it'll feel too bright. Um, so kind of a border mid-range to you know, the lighter tone is kind of where you want to be. And then um, by painting, using just the mask, you have a lot more control. You could switch your, your brush and, and have that layer you know, be that way, but uh, it, it, I like the control of having it just all masked out and then seeing how it's, it's, it's looking at it. The nice thing about that blending mode is it takes the information for what's underneath and it, ex it overexposes that information. So sometimes if you go over with just a solid airbrush on normal blend mode, it's going to hide a lot of really important features, right? So this is something where it's still taking what's there, it's just amplifying a little bit, which is what you want from something like a, a bloom light, something that starts to you know, overexpose a little bit. Um, and then, uh, let's see, final touches. It usually has to do with dimension. So if I'm going to come through on one final layer, it's, it's trying to clean up all these areas that, you know, they don't quite look right. And you can just add different layers of depth. This is this, that Alt button 
picking the color that's there, just kind of going back and forth, making things look more believable with a lot of depth, a lot of scribbling, and a lot of smudge tool, and you'll, you can get these little tiny elements where you want them to be. Another trick that I like to use is figure eights. So if you kind of rotate around in these little figure eight patterns, it creates this uh, mottling effect. I know it's real subtle, but you see that in a lot of areas of the skin, especially as it starts to age, it kind of has this mottling effect where you're seeing um, a scattering of information of, of light and color. And so you might have moments where you just can't get it to quite look right. You did a composite. Um, you may need to come over the top and just do these little tiny figure eights just to kind of blend over the, the two the two worlds. Uh, it works a lot like noise would in a, in a scene. Um, but after this, you can also do a little levels adjustment layer and just kind of finalize anything that might be driving you nuts. You guys lost the main feed. You can kind of play around with levels just to make sure you're not blowing out anything and you know, as long as you're careful kind of um, leading into it and making sure that you're not going too dark and too light, then usually a levels adjustment can kind of finalize the, the last little bit of that contrast and uh, getting everything you want to be. So um, with that, that's all we're going to do on this character. I hope you guys learned something. Um, some of the techniques, like I said, it's monster stuff, but it might be able to be useful somewhere else. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for coming.